Good kitten, Internet. There's a kitten right there. Meow. Trying to get out of your blanket fort? Aww. Hi. Just saying hi. It's okay, kitty cat. I'm going to record a video in here. You can be in it if you want. Or you can take a nap. It's f That's fine, too. Right, son? Right. So, it's been a while since I've last done one of these. Um, sorry about that. I needed to abruptly stop vlogging. I've actually had a couple of days worth of vlogs that I had recorded after my last one, but it was just me repeating things. There was no reason to upload it. But I actually have some updates, and I thought I'd say hi. It's been a while. Ugh. Need to trim my beard. It's a little jaggy at the moment. Anyway, so um, I don't even have my standard lighting on. This is with the lighting on. <laughs> don't need it. It's actually bright and sunny outside. Um, so what's happened in the past month? Just noticed my closet's open. A suspicious cat-shaped hole in the closet. One moment. There, that's better. And that cat shape hole is intentional because that's actually where it sends litter boxes. Um, so there's been a couple of major things that have been going on, and it has to do with why I stopped vlogging as well. Uh, the first is the dispute over storage unit. So my mom passed away back in December of 2019. Uh, the intent was that after a few months, I would come down, go through my mother's things, sort things out, donate everything that needs to be donated, keep the couple of keepsakes I intend on keeping, and that's about it. That didn't happen, because a few months after December 2019 would be the start of the pandemic. Ah. So, none of that happened. And as a result, my mother's house kind of just sat there. Didn't do anything. Roll around about a year. Um, March of 2021, that is. And you'll figure out, timing-wise, why this is the reason why I didn't start... One of the many reasons why I didn't start Vita. Um, I decided to finally pay for a mover to move my mom's things out of the house. Um, my mother's life partner lived right next door because he moved out because he couldn't deal with constantly being around my mother's things anymore. Um... In a lot of ways, I actually think he's more broke up about my mother's death than I am. Probably more because I'm super stoic in general, outside of the times that I have too much emotion. Anyway, um, so I started trying to find a mover. I asked for recommendations from friends that still live in the Palm Beach County area. I asked a friend of mine up here who happens to work for movers in case if they've heard anything about movers down there. And both ended up with the same consensus with a particular company that I shall not be naming for reasons that will become apparent really fast. Um, they were licensed and credited, and their reviews were not good, but a lot of the reviews were... When I had initially read it, it was complaints like, Hey, look, I have this priceless antique that you destroyed during movement. Why did you offer me, like, five bucks for it? And the response of, you didn't take the optional insurance, and our contract specifically states 59 cents a pound for anything that's damaged. And you didn't tell us that you had a priceless antique. You kind of just let us do everything. So, a lot of the reviews were things where I went, okay, this could be them being rough with things. This could also just be the fact that, you know... People lie in order to try to get extra money, or try to make things cheaper. So I gave them the benefit of the doubt, and I had them pack up my mother's things and move them to a storage unit. Uh, specifically, they actually offered storage unit facilities, and that was great, because then I would only have to deal with one company at once. This was while I was still working at Epic, and I didn't want to deal with even more crap on top of everything else. So I paid them an awfully large sum of money and let them get to it. The problem started the day of the move. And again, this is still back, I think at this point this would be April. 
So this would have been around the time that I gave notice at Epic. Uh, I got calls on the morning of. I was getting called from the moving company and also my mother's life partner who was there overseeing to go base. And my instructions to them were basically, hey, look, these are my mother's, my deceased mother's things. I'm not looking to have appliances packed. I'm not looking for furniture to be moved. I am just looking for things. There's going to be somebody physically on site, my mother's life partner, that can tell you what can and uh, what should and should not go. You will be there to observe. I am there to sign all the contracts and pay. Well, not physically there because pandemic. Um, I signed all the contracts in advance. In fact, the last contracts were signed three days before the move and I paid them in advance. Get to the moving day. They are asking my mother's life partner to sign a bunch of the exact same contracts that I signed and also to have him pay for it. Mind you, at this point, they had already charged me for the reservation part of the move, so it's not like they didn't have my credit card number. They obviously had my phone number, given that they called me as well to confirm things. And basically, I spent the entire day having to run back and forth between these people. I ended up taking some time off of work in order to handle this because this was ridiculous. And it turns out that there was only about six boxes of things packed. My mother's life partner didn't realize it was that little stuff. Otherwise, he said that he probably could have just done it himself. I, at the time, didn't know have this information. I just knew there wasn't that much stuff. They moved it. I paid their minimum fees, which ended up being about it's about $950, which is ridiculous in my mind. That's way above anything that should have been happening. But I did agree to that contract. I knew that I would be at their minimum. Fine. Although I don't think I was actually at their minimum because the movers sat there for about two hours after they finished packing everything trying to deal with the stupid contract dispute, which I have a hunch that I paid for. And this was the first sign that I was dealing with what I believe are scammers. At the very least, they're definitely ripping me off. Um, fast forward a bit. In June, after I had left Epic, I had my time in Indiana to try to relax. And then toward the end of the month, I had my time in South Florida to try to deal with my mother's affairs. I, the intent was that I'd go down there speak with family and also check out the storage unit, see what's there and figure out what I should just get rid of because I'm sure they pack things that I don't care about. I don't care about much of anything. I don't actually keep that many keepsakes from family. But do that. Keep the things that I expect to keep, which I just approximated at, you know, maybe two suitcases worth of things. And stop paying for this really expensive storage unit. Oh, I should go with the storage unit. Um, so they never told me how much the storage unit cost. I realized that on moving day. And I had asked them how much it cost, and they told me it was $150 a month per vault. Which is way more than normal. Um, for a frame of reference, the amount of storage that their vault is would probably be about half as much anywhere else. And I was using less than an eighth of the vault. Anyway, I get down there, I go to their office, and I basically walk up and go, hey, look, I would like to look at my storage unit. Um, this is my information. One moment, please. Um, we don't let people look at the storage units. I had anticipated that this was more of a private storage rather than a public storage type of thing, so I knew that there'd be a chance that they may say, okay, give us a day or two. That's the reason why I had arrived on a Wednesday. And I was there for the entire week. They turned around and said, all right, uh, our next available time to allow you to look at your own storage is a week from today. A week's notice is ridiculous. Um, if I had known it was anywhere near that, I would have called in advance, but there's no indication whatsoever. A normal time for storage from everyone that I've asked is, you know, a day or two. Probably more in hours rather than days, but, you know, I'm willing to accept that people are super busy. It might take a day or two. I eventually asked them, okay, fine, just tell me how much stuff is in the storage unit so I can figure out what to do with it.
got back to my grandparents' place, which is where I was staying, and never heard back. In fact, the next time, uh, the first, uh, the last time I had received a phone call would have been the day of the move. The next time I received the phone call would have been the day that I had them, or the day before I had them move everything out. Which was last week. They had never called me back a single time between then. When I got home, I started contacting them. Uh, repeatedly calling, basically going, Hey, look, I want to schedule this move out. So I coordinated, I, I finally got a hold of, or I finally talked with my mom's life partner who mentioned the whole, there's only six boxes there and they can move that in a single truck or two trucks at most, as in pickup truck, not moving truck. Um, they eventually ended up moving it in a single pickup truck load and only one person did it. Uh, they would never get back to me. They would hung, hang up on me. They would forward me on to an infinitely long wait, as in being on hold for hours until somebody would pick up the phone and immediately hang it up. Uh, they would promise callbacks that I would never receive. And meanwhile, they continued charging me. This delay was a full month, which meant that they charged me an extra $150. And then I finally got a hold of their storage unit people who turned around and said, by the way, it's going to cost you $750 to move things out. $750 for the privilege of moving things out on my own. Not asking them to move things out. All I'm asking is access to the storage vault. I understand that it would cost them money and it takes time for them to move the vault out and gain access to things. Not $750 worth. By the way, that price has changed three times because I ended up paying $450. Get to the day of, um, or day before, schedule the time, because they don't schedule times until the day before, even for somebody who's just picking something up from their own site. Ah! Anyway, um... Day of, I tell my mom's life partner, please call me if there's any problems, or please call me when there's any problems, because I knew there was going to be something that would be screwed up. Or call me after if nothing goes wrong. I actually got a call after this time, although only a little bit after. Uh, he had pulled over to like a service station to go use the bathroom, or might have been a grocery store, something like that. He just pulled over to use the bathroom and decided to call me afterward. Turns out they tried to charge him for this as well. They tried to charge him an extra $59 for absolutely no reason. Um, they tried to force him to sign contracts again, even though I specifically told them I am signing everything. And I told my mom's life partner, at most, they should maybe ask you to sign a contract saying, yes, I have picked this up. That is understandable. I would have been okay with that. Anything else? No, that's my responsibility, and I've already signed all of those contracts. Nothing. But my mom's things are out of that God's forsaken storage unit. There's nothing in it. It's theirs now. They are now in my grandparents' garage which actually had enough space for it the entire time because there was so little stuff. That resolved this past week. The move out day was, was it last week? No, it was this past week. Uh, move out day would have been this past Tuesday. So that is the 10th. Uh, today's the 15th Sunday. Uh, so, that's been a huge load of garbage that I've been dealing with, and I still don't know if I should be contacting a lawyer. They've absolutely ripped me off. I have gave, given them a little over $2,000, and there's no way, no way at all that it should have cost anywhere near that much. From what I've been able to tell in Florida state law, they are required to tell you how much money it would cost to move things out of storage, and they never did. The only time that I found out how much it would cost is when I actually scheduled the move out. That's not a part of contract law in Florida for movers. As far as I can tell, they broke the law, but I am not a lawyer. I am not an expert. And you'll notice that I have not mentioned their name the entire time because I do not want to be countersued. Um, 
don't know what to do. Part of me wants to go after them and strip them to the damn bone because I can't stand it when people rip people off, especially when it's ripping me off. Part of me just wants to wash my hands of the thing and go, you know what, I never have to deal with them again, and that's a reward in of itself. I don't know. So that's been a good chunk of what I've been doing lately. And then there's the other part, job hunt. Um, I'm going to make sure I stand over to camera right. And uh, editor me, go ahead and put up the job application image. And I've got a copy of it on my tablet right here. So this is the applications I've done in the past month. Um, I've been very picky about job positions, which is why I've only applied to 69 positions. Nice. Um, 45 via LinkedIn, 5 via Indeed, and 19 via other websites, usually their own website for applications. Um, Again, I've been super picky about job applications. I'm only applying for remote positions at this time. Um, I have worked with a, I didn't even put that on the chart, I have worked with a bunch of recruiters as well, but none of them have actually gotten me anything yet. Uh, most of the recruiters that have contacted me ah, have contacted me are either one, just trying to get my basic information, letting me know, hey, look, we'll keep you in mind when we find something for you. Or two, they contact me with a position that is so much not what I should be doing. Like, intro help desk level work when I've been working IT slash sysadmin type things for 21 years at this point. No, I mean, if they're willing to pay me my salary for the experience that I actually have, I don't have a problem with doing that type of work, but no. No, I'm not going to be tier one help desk. Anyway, um, of those 69 applications, uh, 56 of them I have received no contact with in the past 10 days. Uh, this is fairly typical. And of those 56, 30 of them have been more than 20 days old, which at this point I consider they've ghosted me. This is the unfortunate reality of applications in the year 2021. Um... At least in the IT world, I'm assuming it's very similar for a lot of other positions where they don't even bother getting back to you saying, yeah, we're looking for somebody else. In fact, of the 69 applications, I have been rejected five times. Five. I'm happy to receive a rejection because it means closure. I don't have to think about that position anymore. I know that they have found somebody else or if they decided not to hire or maybe they just decided that I wasn't a good fit. That's fine. That is their prerogative. It's probably more that their uh, automated resume scanning thing just scanned through my resume, didn't pick up the correct keywords and went, nope, crumble up, throw away. <sighs> I hate those automated processes so much, by the way. Anyway, um, however, so... Yeah, that means that 26 of them have been within 10 to 20 days that I've not received contact. I'm expecting all of those to turn into ghosts. Because usually at this point, I would have received something. Now, having said that, sometimes it's two to three weeks, and that could be up to 21 days. It's certainly possible I may get a contact back. That's fine. Um, the remaining ones, I have seven pending, which... By pending, what I mean is that I submitted within the past 10 days, and I have not heard back yet. Some of those I submitted, like for instance, I submitted one this morning. So obviously I'm not going to hear back yet. Today's a Sunday. Who in the world is going to be looking at job applications on Sunday? Um, some of them are ones that I've submitted within the past week or so. I usually apply in batches of five at a time, and some of them are ones that I got rejected for. Um... There is one that I've actually gone to a phone screen phase. Um, that By phone screen phase, what I mean is that they respond back and go, yeah, you actually look like the type of person we're interested in. Can we have a quick phone conversation? A phone screen, at least in the IT world, once more I can't speak to other employment types, but I'm pretty sure a lot of technical positions are very similar. A phone screen is basically where the person is going to talk to you on the phone and make sure that you exist and are real. Um, obviously, you can put whatever you want in a resume. I can say that I was an astronaut for 55 of my 37 years of life. I can put that on my resume, 
their automated HR process might pick up astronaut as a tag, and if they're looking for an astronaut, they might go, sweet, let's continue along with this person. The phone screen phase is for somebody to call and go, okay, are you a really real person? They're not going to ask a bunch of in-depth technical questions or anything like that, but they're going to get an idea, a gist as to what are your expectations with this job? Uh, can you answer a couple of questions for me? Like, for instance, um, what are your salary expectations? Or what have you been doing for your line of work? Which, I hate that question. They can just read my resume. And they obviously haven't, because otherwise they'd be asking for clarification on parts of my resume, which would be nice. Um, they'll also ask questions like, can you tell me of a time that you had a disagreement with a team member and what the result of that happened to have been and how did you work with that? Or in my case, because I'm applying for primarily project manager positions, uh, an issue that endangered a project, how did you work around that? Basic questions, things that any HR person could ask. They don't require any technical knowledge or technical background or anything like that. I have gone through the phone screen phase for one application and they have advanced me to the actual interview phase. I'm going to have interview an interview scheduled this coming week. They asked me for times. They haven't gotten back to me after I gave them times, but that was only Friday. That's not, that's not even close to abnormal. Um, I expect they seem to be about a one day response time when I've been emailing them. So I expect to hear back Monday. Um, that is definitely the most advanced pro prospect that I have right now, but there is one other prospect that I am actually excited about. So I mentioned at the top that I've been very picky about these types of jobs. So what I mean by picky is that at this particular time, what I'm looking for is a remote position that allows me to work from home at the moment and eventually allows me to work from Norway. That last part is a very big filter, to put mildly. What I mean is... A lot of positions will specifically state, yes, you can remote work, but you need to reside in the state that this job is in. They're obviously not going to let me work from Norway. Or any of the positions that I've been seeing that require me to get United States security clearance. They're definitely not going to let me work from outside the United States. No, no, that's not a thing. Um, although I did see a job that required NATO security clearance, which would be interesting because Norway is a part of NATO. In theory, that could actually work. They had other requirements that made me not apply anyway. Um, but I'm looking for positions like that. I'm looking for relatively high paying positions, which I'll put a pin on that. I'll get back to that in a moment. Or I am looking for remote positions that are temporary, um, ones that I would work until I moved to Norway. That's all I'm looking for right now. And I'm quite aware that I could apply and receive a normal full time position here in Wisconsin and then just leave after however many months it's going to be when I move. This is what I mean by I'm being really picky, is that I'm being upfront with everybody. I am specifically stating, hey, look, I'm going to be relocating outside the country. Um, the interview prospect that I have hasn't actually given me a chance to say that. So I, that position may end up being sunk as a result of that. But... Yeah, I'm also not looking for sysadmin work at the moment. I am working, looking at project management work, or IT project management, or IT architecture is specifically what I'm going for. But people are terrible with titles in IT world. Um, so it comes under a whole bunch of different titles from systems architect, systems engineer, IT engineer, IT architect, IT project management, uh, systems project management. And also some of those titles happen to share with developer titles, which I am not a developer. Um, well, sort of. I can do DevOps type of work, which... Oh, that's a whole nother story in of itself. But long story short, I can do some development work, um, but I am not a developer. I will not make an app for a device, for instance. I cannot really help too much in any of the actual development work. If they want me to set up a testing infrastructure or something like that, I can do that. But the actual development is out of my wheelhouse. What I can do is development work for, hey, look, here's a set of code. 
take this code and turn it into deployed systems. That's the type of development work I can do. Well, technically I am capable of doing application development work, I just don't have the experience, which means I would not be paid anywhere near as much as I am for my actual position. Um, so back to the one offer that I'm actually genuinely excited about, or not offer, um, posting. It's a, I, I have a bunch of emails that come in on a daily basis with new positions for various titles. Basically I'm keyword searching for titles and I'll get emails. I've been receiving, let's see, the first time that I started doing this type of thing way back when I was first job hunting before starting work at Epic, I might see one or two a week. And I wasn't using keywords anywhere near as detailed as I am right now. I was doing very generic and vague keywords because I was looking for pretty much anything. Um, while working at Epic and when I was doing my job hunt then, I had, and this would have been pre-pandemic for reference, I had been putting in reasonable keywords, very similar to the ones that I'm doing right now, and I would get a few a day rather than a few a week. I'm getting about 50 a day right now. Now, also, I'm filtering these quite a bit more than I used to. These are 50 remote positions a day. The pandemic has done wonders for my industry, believe it or not. Uh, it's almost as though people need a lot more IT work when everybody's working from home. And a lot of companies have realized that people working from home means they don't have to spend as much money. So maybe they should invest more in IT and ditch the office. So there's actually a large amount of demand for the work that I try to do, which is why I'm capable of being picky. This position, on the other hand, is based in Norway. There's two positions. I actually found the one that I'm less qualified for initially, but I applied, I'm applying for both. I've already applied for one and I'm applying for the other one after this recording, but um, it's a position with a Norwegian online grocer. Um, the equivalent in the U.S. is probably like a, um, one of the online grocery things, like, uh, uh, why am I ha why am I blanking on the names of these companies? Um, they're not as popular around here, but, like, the types of places, like, for instance, the DoorDash type of thing, only for grocery stores, um, or... Uber Eats or Grubhub or Eat Street is local to here in Madison, but those types of companies, only this is based in Norway, which means they're actually paying their employees and not treating them like contractors. Um, which, okay, that company actually sounds fine. It's a startup, but it's a startup that's actually been around for a few years now. So it's not like they're brand new, so they're probably not going to immediately lay off everybody. Not to mention again, based in Norway. I actually have worker protections there. Um, the entire job position was in English. Now, I have been looking at job positions in Norway. I can read some Norwegian at this point. Not a huge amount, but I can read enough to do a quick glance and then copy and paste the relevant information into Google Translate to kind of understand what I'm getting at. Um, job positions are pretty much always in Norwegian, because in Norway, Outside of a couple of industries, IT is one of them to be fair, but outside of a couple of industries, you are required to be able to read and speak Norwegian in order to hold the job. So finding a job position in Norway that reads in English is usually a sign of an international corporation. Uh, like for instance, an oil company, which they might be drilling for oil off the shore of Norway because Norway is an oil producing country. Since they're an international corporation, chances are their job positions aren't going to be in Norwegian because they're looking internationally for positions, so it'll be in English. This is actually a Norwegian company that's wanting that put their job position in English. And in fact, when I read the position, it only required English proficiency and not Norwegian, which is very abnormal. The reason why somebody would do that, and it's the case here, is that they're looking to recruit from outside of Norway and bring them to Norway. On that job position, they had specifically stated 
that they would help with relocation. This is the first time, and I knew in theory there had to be positions like this, where it was a Norwegian company looking for recruiting for an advanced position of some variety, and they're willing to go outside of the country to do it, including dealing with all of the immigration forms and so on. They had to exist. It exists everywhere. But finding those needles in a haystack, I basically considered impossible. Until that one. Two positions available. The one that I found is actually an engineering manager position. Um, this is where, remember what I had said before about sometimes they use the same titles like what I have for a developer? This is one of those times. This is a developer position rather than a sysadmin position, but it's DevOps work, which is more my area of development. I'm just not as experienced as I am with other things. Um, rather than having 21 years of experience, I would probably say I have more like five which, to be fair, is actually more than what they're asking for in the position, but it means that I probably can't command as high of a salary. Anyway, I found that position, and it's like, holy crap, this is awesome. I'm going to apply even though I'm not completely on their requirements, but I'm close. I mean, if I was given that position, I'm sure that I would do fine. It's just, am I going to get through their HR filter? So... Rather than going through, I, this was found via LinkedIn, if I remember correctly, I went to their website. Uh, it's always a good idea, by the way, anybody trying to do a job hunt, if you're finding a position available on one of these job aggregation websites, go to their actual website, hit their careers page, and see what's there. Sometimes what's on LinkedIn isn't updated, sometimes it doesn't have key information, and sometimes, like in this case, they're missing positions. I found an IT project manager position, which is the one that I have more like 21 years of experience rather than five. Um, the engineering management position is interesting. I think I would do well. I wouldn't really hesitate about applying. The only reason why I've technically hesitated is that I need to reword my cover letter for it. Um, and they specifically say on their website, go ahead and apply for multiple positions. So I know I'm not going to harm anything that way. Um, but the IT project manager position, I am completely qualified for. I have done everything that they're asking for. I have experience with everything. They're asking for experience in the few years plus category. I have 21 years. They're asking for experience with a dynamic environment where you might need to all of a sudden spin on a dime and go try to get something done. It's kind of what I was doing at Epic. So... I'm really excited about that. I am not the type of person that lives to work. I don't like defining myself via my work. At the same time, this is a position that actually aligns with my goals. That's not common. And the fact that they have the position open now, when it's not possible for somebody like me, an American, to enter Norway, means that they are open to remote work to start which is exactly what I want. Remote for now, once I move to Norway, I'm significantly less concerned about it being remote work. I would prefer it. I would prefer not to live in Oslo, which is where this company is located. Even if it's on the outskirts of Oslo, it's still Oslo. Oslo is in Eastern Norway. Um, my partner lives in Western Norway, so it's a fairly large distance away. It's, what, 14 hours travel if you're not flying? It's kind of like if, for us Americans, if you had a partner who lived in Chicago and your job was in New York City. Yeah, you can fly back and forth, but that's a, still a pretty long distance away. Um, it's the same equivalent. Um, so if they want me physically in the location, that means I'm going to live in Oslo. I'll do it. It's still a lot closer than Madison, Wisconsin is to Western Norway. Um... Yeah, yeah, I'm actually excited, and I spent a lot of time doing research on this particular position. Normally, when I'm looking at positions, I do what I call baseline research. So when I'm doing my five jobs in one shot, usually what I end up doing is that I do about 
five to 10 minutes of re basic research before applying. Because push comes to shove, after I get contact back, like for instance, in the one job that I went through a phone screen of, when they scheduled the phone screen, I started doing more heavy research into the organization. That one's more like an hour or two. Seeing if they're on the up and up, seeing if they have a particular set of values that I disagree with, like for instance, if they're an anti-masker corporation, that has in fact happened once in my application history. Um, although I caught them before applying in this case. Or if they're in a location that they're saying remote for now and I would need to go there and that location is not a location that I want to be in. This company, on the other hand, I it rang alarm bells in my head, assuming that it was too good to be true. Because it pretty much is. Um, and started doing heavy research and it's actually rated fairly high. They tout their work-life balance. They tout flexible working hours. It's physically located in Norway, which means that there's actual worker protections and their work week is below 40 hours. Um, also means that their required time off it well exceeds anything that I've ever received in the United States. The only downside is that they don't have their salary position posted. Um, Norway actually has open records when it comes to looking at salaries. As a, you can look at the, ta and tax records are public information. You can look and see any person's salary, which means, in theory, I can look up to see what every person in that corporation makes to get an idea as to how much they pay. Unfortunately, they recently closed that information to the outside world. You need to be a Norwegian citizen in order to actually get that information. And even then, I think you have to jump through a couple of hoops. The company isn't that old. And they were really small up until somewhat recently, which means I think that might be their first IT project management position. IT work pays less in Europe than it does in the US. Um, so for a frame of reference, and I'm going to be talking about salary here, um, I'll, there's stuff in the description cutting up sections. So if you don't want to hear about salary details, because it is a taboo in the United States for various reasons, um, go ahead and skip through. I, at Epic, my final salary was $109,000 a year. Through this application process, and uh, thank random deities for the state of Colorado, by the way, because in Colorado, you're required to post your salary. And since I'm looking for remote work, in theory, if the position is available for somebody who lives in the state of Colorado, they have to post the salary on the position, which means that I'm actually seeing salary ranges for these positions, which made me realize just how underpaid I was for the work that I was doing for Epic. Turns out I'm about, was about 20% underpaid. Um, for the cost of living of Madison, I should expect more like 125 to $135,000 a year for the work that I was doing for one of the jobs that I was holding. Um, my work at Epic, I basically had three separate jobs that I was just squishing all together. Uh, that's pretty common in the IT industry. Well, three is a little, three separate ones are a little weird. Normally it's more like two of the same job and maybe one side job. Um, so I'm looking at salaries being significantly higher than normal. Now, some of the positions that I stepped over because their posted salary range is just woefully inadequate for what I'm doing. Like for instance, there was a position that was based in Seattle. It was Seattle or remote is what they said. And they were only offering $60,000 a year. $60,000 a year in Seattle does not exactly go very far. It's roughly the equivalent of minimum wage here in Madison. Those are what I refer to as H1B bait. Um, H1B is a United States law classification for bringing immigrants in from outside the United States to take technical positions because the company cannot find somebody who satisfies the requirements. The way they frequently do that is by having ludicrously high requirements and very low pay. Like for instance, this particular position was asking for a PhD in computer science, which there's no reason at all why a sysadmin or IT project manager or IT architect position would need a PhD. No reason. Uh, honestly, PhDs in computer science are useful for teaching computer science and doing research, like development research. 
that's none of these. Anyway, um, so for instance, in the one company that I have the phone interviews coming up, when they had asked me for my salary range, I actually lowballed myself slightly and said I am looking for a position that pays one hundred thirty-five to one hundred fifty-five thousand dollars a year. They'd also ask me for what it would be for a contract position. In the United States, a full-time position has benefits, you know, like health insurance, um, paid time off, stuff like that. And also the company pays payroll taxes on you. Um, in the United States, you and in most countries actually for this one, um, there's both income tax and payroll tax. Payroll tax is the part the employer pays, income tax is the part the individual pays. Um, a contract position, there's no payroll tax. It all goes on to the individual, which means that you have to pay the individual more um, because they're going to have to start paying their own payroll tax. Uh, it's the same as being self-employed. You are basically paying the payroll tax for yourself. In addition, contract positions are hourly wage rather than salary, which means in the United States, you would actually get overtime if you worked more than 40 hours. So most of those contract positions are 40 hours or under to make sure that they don't have to pay for overtime. I am open to a contract-like position right now because I don't want to deal with health insurance. I'll get to that later because this is salary section. Um, so I had specifically asked for 95 to $115 an hour, which is a lot more than that salary would normally pay it's to make up for taxes and the fact that I won't be working all the same hours because... I'll be taking time off. I need breaks. And time off just means time off without pay rather than vacations. Um, or vacation, or, or holidays, or anything like that. Plus, I'm still paying for my health insurance. That doesn't work the same way in Norway. Contract positions are different in Norway. I know that you still have the same divide on pay for payroll tax and salary, or an income tax. Well, as in, the divide exists, not the actual percentages are the same. What I don't know is what the percentages are. And a Norwegian company paying or hiring somebody who lives in the United States, <clears throat> unless if that company happens to have, say, for instance, outsourced payroll, where they've outsourced it to a third party that handles everything for them, including international payrolls, they're not going to put me on a normal salary. They're going to treat me as a contract position because that's a lot easier for Norwegian tax law and most tax law. I have a red mask, don't I? Huh, I actually got a little bit of sun from my walk, I'm guessing, this morning. I was wearing glasses. You can see where the lines are. Anyway, um, so I've been trying to do research into how much, if they ask me how much I expect to make, how much to say, because I don't want to scare them off. I don't know how to answer that. Um, I know that I was being underpaid in the United States. I also know that in Norway, my pay would have been overpay. So you can look at my position at Epic as either I was a senior level system administrator or I was a senior-ish um, IT project manager or a senior-ish systems architect. Um, if you look at it from the least charitable perspective, which is the sysadmin part, I make $109,000 a year is slightly above what I should be making in the United States, or in Madison, Wisconsin, specifically, for that type of position. Now, given that that wasn't my entire bit of work, that was obviously being underpaid overall, but if you take that sysadmin position and look at an equivalent position in Norway, if I would be making $109,000 a year, I would be the highest paid system administrator in Norway. Entirely highest paid. There'd be no exceptions. So that's obviously not going to work. That's part of the reason why I started diving into my other titles to go, okay, which of these titles pays more? And am I, am I okay with just doing that job rather than doing the smorgasbord that I'm doing right now? Oh, well, not right now. I'm not employed right now, but you get the idea. Uh, turns out... Yeah, yeah, I'd be okay with that. Um, so yeah, I'm going, I did a lot more research on that particular job. Uh, another benefit of that job is that I don't need to deal with the health insurance problem. So 
In the United States, there is a federal law called COBRA. I can't remember what it stands for. Maybe editor me will put it up. Maybe editor me will completely skip the section. I don't know. But COBRA allows you to pay your previous employer for health insurance after you have left a position. I am on COBRA right now, which means that I am paying, I think it's $445 a month for health insurance. For those of you outside the U.S., this probably sounds like an extremely large amount of money to pay for health insurance, and I understand. For those of you in the U.S., this sounds like probably a normal figure to being slightly below average, until I mentioned that I am paying for health insurance, and I am 100% covered on pretty much everything that I do. Um, the only co-pays that I have are for prescription drugs. Uh, it doesn't cover the luxury bones, those, or vision. Uh, it covers an eye exam, but it doesn't actually cover glasses. Which means that I actually have the U.S. equivalent of Norwegian health insurance, where everything is covered outside. I have a couple of minor things which have very low co-pays. I mean, for example, my monthly prescriptions, of which I have five, cost me... Is it $15 a month? $20 a month? Something like that? It's not that much. Um, what was I saying? Oh, right. The problem with COBRA is that you can take it for either a year and a half or until an employer offers you health insurance. A year and a half will put me to well beyond the point where I'll be in Norway. That's fine. I am A-OK -okay with this. Um, and... The until the employer offers you health insurance is actually one of the major reasons why I'm concerned about getting another job. Like, for instance, the job that gave me, or that is going to be interviewing me. If they hired me full-time, that means that they'd be offering health insurance. That health insurance is going to be significantly worse in every way than the health insurance I have now. For me. Um, I heavily use healthcare. It's almost as though this doesn't work very well, and neither does this, or any other part of my body for that matter, which means that I tend to spend more money on the average compared to the average American on healthcare, or median American, not average. I don't know if I actually spend more than the average American or not. Anyway, um... I would also lose my therapist because presumably it wouldn't be covered by my health insurance either at all or a different therapist would be covered instead for whatever health network that they have. And in general, just a really bad time. That's one of the reasons why I've been looking at contract work. And one of the reasons why I had mentioned in the money section, and I'm repeating it here in case of people had skipped the money section, why I would be happy to accept contractor pay over full-time pay right now, it's because then I don't have to deal with their health insurance, I deal with my own. In the case of a Norwegian company, on the other hand, presumably, if I was living in Norway, I would just be enrolled in the national insurance scheme for Norway. That doesn't cover things in the US, obviously. So if they offered me a full-time position, I have no idea how they would try to cover insurance, if they would even do it while I'm living in the U.S., that is, uh, a contract-style position, which is what I think they would try to offer me, it becomes easy because it's now my responsibility. I already have good insurance. I just go with that until I move to Norway. Uh, factoring also into the money question, and I'm, I'm done talking specifics about money for reference, um, is Oslo. Oslo is one of the most expensive cities in the world to live in. Now, this particular job is not downtown. It's in the northern part of Oslo. Um, hey, me, editor me, wake up. Uh, could you put a map over there? Thanks. Um, it's in the northern part of Oslo. Um, not quite suburbia, but definitely not downtown. Um, it's actually a section of Oslo I've been near. So I actually recognize names of things when I was looking at a map. It was kind of weird, even though it's been... 15 years since I was in Oslo, I think. Um, so I started looking at rent prices over there. One of the ways that you can try to figure out how much should I ask for money-wise is to compare housing prices. Madison is a relatively high-cost housing market. Um, the house that I live in, if I were to buy it again, 
I would be spending a lot of money on housing. It would be a sizable percentage of my income. Whereas right before I had left Epic, it was a relatively small percentage of my income because I bought my house eight years ago and I didn't buy the largest size house that I could or anything like that. So looking at rent prices for an apartment, uh, 75 square meter apartment is what I'm aiming for, which for reference in Freedom Units, it's about 800 square feet. It's the smallest size apartment that I think myself and my three cats will be happy in. Um, if my cats actually behaved, I could probably get away with a little bit smaller, but it's a good guideline right now. Those are running about the equivalent of twenty four dollars to $3,000 a month. That's a lot of money for housing. Food prices are significantly higher in Oslo as well. Um, Madison actually has low food prices, unlike most other types of costs for the U.S., just because we're kind of in the middle of farms. But there's still farms in city limits. Uh, food is cheap, especially cheese or beer. Um, so the overall cost of living in Oslo is significantly higher than the cost of living in Madison. So I have to be conscious of the fact that I am going to be moving to a place with a much higher cost of living, and I do not have any fixed costs in the U.S. anymore. When I was looking at moving to Madison from Angola, Indiana, I was looking at the same problem, except that my number one cost was my student loan. My student loan is a fixed cost. That is, the amount of money that I was spending per month paying back my student loan was the same whether I lived in Angola, Indiana, or Angola, the country. <laughs> um, I'd have to pay the same amount of money. I don't have any fixed costs at this point. I'm not paying... Well, Technically, I still own my mom's house, and the property tax on that would be a fixed cost. And technically, I still own this house, but when I move, I'm not going to be owning it anymore. So I'm assuming I'm not owning any homes. Um, I don't have any fixed costs, which means that I am much more sensitive to price increases for cost of living increases. Norway is likely not going to pay me. Like, if you took my salary and adjust it by the cost of living... I am likely not going to receive that. And I'm back. Uh, let's see, I was talking about housing. So housing is the way I'm trying to figure out how much to ask for, basically. And trying to get something that I will be happy with. I don't know if this is going to be the place I'm going to be at for the next 10 years. But I don't like job hunting, so I'd really prefer it. And it sounds interesting. You want to be in the video, Zane? I mean, you're already in the intro. There we go. See? Aren't you a pretty game? Yes, you are. <sighs> and son's, or Isun's fine, by the way. He was just trying to cough up a hairball and ended up not coming up. So yeah, um, those are the things that I've been working on for the past week, on top of de-stressing by playing lots and lots of lap Rabby Ribby. Um, Rabby Ribby, by the way, is a Metroidvania bullet hell Yuri game. Um, Metroidvania games are games in the style of Castlevania or Metroid, where it's a platform-ish game, platform-ish action adventure where you're exploring around trying to do things typically with a central hub of some variety or with lots of secrets and things to explore and so on. Um, bullet Hell is usually a shoot 'em up feature where there's lots and lots of bullets on the screen at the same time that you need to go dodge around and so on. Um, boss attacks are, and regular enemy attacks as well, are Bullet Hell and Rabby Ribby. Also, Yuri game. Oh boy, is there a lot of innuendo, to put it mildly. Um, and there is a single male named character in the entire game. One. There are dozens of women who are named. Very few male enemies, for that matter, too. It's just... Yep. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. Um, I have not just beaten it, but beaten the epilogue of the game, 100%ed all of the maps, 100%ed all of the items, 100%ed all of the Easter eggs. Um, I just haven't played on higher difficulties, 
and I haven't beaten the optional, optional, optional bosses. Or new game pluses. But that's what I've been doing. And now, after this is done, I'm probably going to go back and record some Wild Arms. Wild Arms? What year is this? I meant Vindal Hearts, sorry. Anyway. If you're still watching, holy crap, you've watched a nearly an hour-long video of an update. What the heck? Um, hi. Otherwise, I'll talk to you next time. Bye, Internet.